Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Energy and Mobility Forum at Planeteers World Gathering. Uh, this forum is powered by uh, Credibom and Breeza. My name is Richard Bloom, and I'm going to be your moderator for this session. Uh, we have two main sessions here this morning. The first is on the future mobility and the implications, and the second is on the energy transition, how, the sustainable energy transition. We have a great list of speakers. I'm going to read out the names of the speakers for the first session, and then we'll start with some presentations after that, followed by a panel. So we have uh, Luis Costa, who's the partner at get to see committed to decarbonizing society with services in the area of climate, uh, carbon, and energy. We have Pedro Gaspar, Future Business Technology Director at the Centre for Engineering and Product Development, a state-of-the-art and product development centre, and one of the 10 largest uh, R&D investors in Portugal. We have Antonio Gonzalez Pereira, who's the president at ECOMOOD, the Association for the Promotion of Sustainability and Solidarity in Human Mobility. And we have Joao Felix, who's founder and CEO at uh, Mobiag, a, a, a solutions provider in, in the shared mobility space. So first of all, I'm going to ask uh, Luis to come up on stage with the presentation. Uh, and then after that, your next speaker up on stage. Thank you. Hello, good morning to you all. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, well, on the pathway to carbon neutrality, my idea is that uh, technology is no longer the bottleneck. And what do I mean by that? So let me just give you a brief uh, overview on how do we work uh, carbon neutrality pathway. So we've developed the Portuguese carbon neutrality pathway and we've uh, since we've developed many municipalities uh, carbon neutrality pathways and we always start by matching the technology with the reality of the country or the municipality. What do I mean by that? So uh, I don't know, if we, if, if we have for instance Portugal so we have a lot of sun, so we can design the maximum capacity or the ideal capacity of solar plants that we should have in Portugal. The same with uh, wind farms uh, and so on and so forth. And that is pretty straightforward. So technology can answer, I wouldn't say 100% of the current carbon neutrality pathways. There are some challenges, particularly in you know, uh, long-run transportation. That's uh, something that is still to be tackled. But I would say that in the short to medium term, technology fits everything that we need to have. But the second part, so we start with those projections that we have that leads to carbon neutrality. The second part is, so how do we develop policies that actually implement the technologies that we have to have in order to achieve uh, uh, carbon neutrality? That is a little bit more challenging. Okay? And uh, we can say that uh, still, you know, governments have a pretty good idea on how to develop those. Uh, you know, Portugal have been doing that uh, uh, pretty well. Uh, some other countries, uh, you know, I think that still policy is not a bottleneck on achieving carbon neutrality. So, what do we have left? So, we actually have to implement projects. So, one thing is that we have to understand and have to have the tools to see if, you know, building a, a wind farm or a solar farm, uh, which one is better? Which one should we do first? Which one should we put our money investment into? And yet, you know, I think we're also pretty good at doing that. So valuations and all those kind of things that actually make us do the best decision, it's still something that we have developed for, for the past years and even if we put new variables into it, so we're, not, we're no longer talking only about pure value, so we, yeah, uh, stranded assets has come to, to the, the, the valuation scene and some, some other stuff. So what is left? If we can do all these things, what is left? Why can't we you know, see carbon neutrality as something that is absolutely doable and uh, it's just around the corner? And that's the tricky part. 
And that's the thing that we've been trying to deal with for, you know, since Paris Agreement came. And that's changing mentalities. And let me give you just a brief example of what I mean. So, nowadays, uh, I'm almost sure that all the people in this room has left either, you know, uh, the TV turned on or some light at, the, at their apartment is left uh, uh, on or maybe the, you, you didn't uh, switch off the, the, how do you call it, the, the TV box. mail or whatever, the, 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 the box, the yeah, setup, exactly. And when you add all that up, the average, the, the average uh, consumption, uh, it's about 200 watts per hour. Okay, so we're living 200 watts per hour free over there to be, you know, spent doing absolutely nothing. And if you do all the math and do, you reverse all that, it means that we need a full one megawatt wind uh, so, uh, solar farm working there for nothing. And that one megawatt solar farm means that more than one football field is being occupied just for people to have their comfort. But is it really comfort? Am I more comfortable because I left the box uh, t turned on or the light on? No. So, how can we change our behavior? And that's actually, that's what's in the critical path to achieve carbon neutrality. And how are we going to tackle that? And then we come back to, you know, it can be technology. So there is technology that is not directly, you know, into being more efficient with uh, energy or, or having a, a better mobility. It's about changing our behavior. And uh, if we can do that, if we can actually change our behavior, carbon neutrality is just around the corner. Thank you so much. Okay, so starting. My name is Pedro. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I came with Saya. A green or not? Yeah, we were, we Portugal were the first ones to come up with a consent and put it out and then roll it, we were pretty much rolled it out through the, through the world. Which took us for the next, so that was the first step that took us for the next step. The, the platform I was mentioned that um, we presented a couple of years ago in New York, AIR, uh, that helps cit cities and citizens to make more sustainable choices. Uh, just a quick example, we deployed in several places. Um, last year, we deployed in Brazil, in Santa Catarina. And I'm using the Brazil example because right now in Santa Catarina, you are able to quantify your saved emissions, receive the credits, and use it to buy a bus ticket. Okay? Which it's, I would say, pretty cool <laughs> if you want. And the challenge there, where everything started, was because the municipality wanted to reduce traffic and increase the usage of public transportation. So, again, applying this and helping citizens to make more sustainable choices and changing behavior, we really have uh, impact. Now, we told, everything I mentioned is either we did it or it's being done, being deployed. Let's talk just for a couple of minutes for the next steps, what we are preparing. So one of the things we are playing with is the concept of shared use with shared property. This is something that I know it's, so even, even for us, we are still closing the concept by himself, but the, in the end of the day, um, when we talk about sharing, usually we just talk about the usage. So I use a, a, a car, a bicycle, whatever, right? But it's owned by a company. What if even the ownership is shared? And I'm able to, although I get, I'm, I'm own of a fraction of the vehicle itself, but I also get revenue because of that fraction. 
we, we strongly believe that although, and this has been the pitch for the sharing, uh, we don't need to own cars, we don't need to own true, but at the same time, if I own a little bit of that car, or means of transportation, not exactly the car, maybe I can have an extra revenue on that. This takes us for something that we are building also, uh, regarding the, the advanced air mobility, this is, uh, this is our, our concept, I will show a little bit, but if, if we look, the main idea is to have what we call a skate that can fit different uh, pods with different purposes. Uh, I don't know, this may sound a little bit, you know, futuristic, but in the end of the day, let me just jump this, doesn't matter much, but in the end of the day, if you think about it, I can use the skate integrated with my air mobility, with drones, I can have different pods, so it means I can have different, since bus, autonomous vehicles uh, moving around, I can have uh, cars by himself with, with the different pods, or I can integrate with uh, electrical aerial. In the end of the day, think of this this way, what we are building, and this is being built, uh, what we are building is a modular concept that can adapt the same concept to different uh, contexts, to different usages, to different cities. Now, let me just close saying this. Some of these things may sound a little futuristic. People say, yeah, you know, that's nice, nice slides, you guys are building a couple of things, some of those things, okay, they're already there, but, you know, it's a little futuristic, you know, Pedro, maybe, you know, we are a little far away. Two, two notes on that. First, we are not that good trying to imagine the future. We are not that good. And then there is the second thing, the pace of innovation. The innovation, the next 15 years, the pace of innovation is only going to accelerate. So which means that most of the problems that we have right now to solve from technical perspective to implement these kind of things, they are going to get solved way faster than we think. Some of them, they are already solved. We can do quite a lot of things even regarding the air mobility front that we still don't present because they are not ready for the prime time. But on the next few years, you can count that most of the problems that doesn't allow us to put this on the market, they will be solved. And this is what we are uh, betting on and, and doing on. So hopefully this opens up for our discussion. I'll try, I don't know, there we go. Okay, thank you guys, thank you. Uh, reflections. I'm curious to hear, well, now we've heard from two of you, let's uh, start with those that we haven't heard from, just reflections on uh, the overall theme of energy, of mobility I guess we're, we're still on now, and uh, how it relates to your work for example. Awesome. Shall I start? Well, good morning, thank you very much for having me. I'm Antonio from, from Portugal, and uh, let me start by uh, making a question to everyone here. Who came by public transportation? This is a nice surprise, but we're close to everything here. Who came by shared, some, some shared means of transportation? Or by bike? Yes, I use both. Okay, this is news. You all came by car. No, I haven't. Oh, I wasn't <laughs> looking there. But this is one of the things usually in these panels, uh, decisors and people who are debating this. Oh, thank you. Ah, it's on. Yes. Um, it's people that came by car, maybe with chauffeur sometimes, to discuss how others should be using public transportation and things like that. This is good news here. Um, let me just say that uh, um, I'm not much a geek. I'm not very much into the technical part, even though I like to absorb all information and I really admire those who are one step ahead and working uh, sometimes in things that we don't even understand yet. Um, but uh, usually uh, we are concerned, are concerned with the nowadays and the things, the problems we have now and that should be 
be solved, uh, should be solved now. And um, we have three words in mobility, integration, coordination, and uh, well, the other one is very specific, it's conversion. Let me just say integration, we've already uh, saw it here. Um, it's the main thing. Uh, let me tell you, for instance, um, I'm here really worried because I had to leave my bike on near to a train station that has no bike parking, no covered bike parking. So if it rains a lot, uh, my, my bike will suffer and, uh, um, and uh, maybe it gets stolen even. Uh, and then I took a train and then the subway and as, at that time they are very frequent, there's no problem of coordination. But many people have a lot of problems of coordination because, well, they have the problem of the bike, they, have, they don't have a bus with the right schedule to the train station. Um, now they have parking meters in, meters in the train station there, so if they pay there, well, they bring their car to Lisbon and they pay it here. Uh, this is nonsense. But then, so they don't have the coordination between the bus, uh, the bus um, uh, schedule with the train schedule, uh, no place to leave the bike, the, so they bring the car. And in all the conferences and, and debates we have been organizing lately, it's really nice that people that defend the bike and the purchases, they all start by saying, the problem, the, the, the thing is, car is very comfortable. Having a car is very comfortable. And until the moment we have uh, almost personalized solutions for everybody's needs, people will still get, use the car. We have been building our cities for decades now due to the car. In, uh, the goal is uh, the car having a nice time, not us, the car. And um, until we coordinate and integrate, have uh, integrated solutions um, on our phones, uh, so that oh, oh, I can take a shared, a shared uh, electric bike here, and then the bus over there. Okay. Until we have that information, and we don't have things like free. free I, my daily uh, vehicle is the bike, and every time I come to Lisbon, I take the train, and then here I usually take the subway or. Uh, shared bike. But for instance, if I go to where I live in the Estoril to Amadora, my only choice is to take the car. I don't want to, but the choice is between 20 minutes and nearly three hours to get there. This is stupid. This is what we must solve very, very fast. Um, the other, the other, sorry, the, I, did, I, I chose not to make a presentation, then I'm making it anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, the other, the other key word here, and now this is for cars, cars will, cars will not disappear. Uh, but let's just say that throwing to the garbage and building new, it's not a sustainable way. The sustainable way is conversion, is reutilizing. So we shouldn't be promoting to send our petrol and uh, diesel cars to the garbage to, to build, to produce, to buy new electric ones. In some cases that's uh, what we need to do, but in most cases, just remember, we are still producing diesel and petrol cars nowadays. In three, four, five years, those cars won't be allowed in the cities. Are we going to throw them to the garbage? Two tons of metal and plastic and whatever? No, no, we should, must convert them, turn them into electric or whatever the next technology will be. Well, it's electric. The, the, the battery parts will evolve, but the engines we know will be mainly electric. Uh, so we should convert them, we should be converting them. We're working, uh, trying to work with the government, well, it's the three Secretary of State in a row that we're trying to do this, <laughs> so that Portugal bets on this industry, uh, the conversion industry. We have everything here. We now even have the lithium. We have everything here to make this a very, um, a, a very a, a head, maybe say it wants to, to embrace this as well. It's not rocket science, sorry, it's been done for many, 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 many years now. I, I'll, I'll say that, I'll tell you that in uh, Holland and England and United States, the, the, cla the classic car people, which are converting, well, one of the classic cars, so they can say that, well, I have the first Porsche 356 electric, but um, it, they have a three-year uh, waiting list. And now, finally, those companies are starting, because they have better legis legis legislation than we do, um, now they're starting to industri industrialize this. 
and it's, it's, it's going to be a huge market. We cannot be throwing to the garbage and uh, to recycle everything that we use, and certainly not cars. Uh, a Range Rover, a 10 year old Range Rover is a hell of a car. We shouldn't be saying to people, oh, here's some three or four thousand euros, throw that to the garbage, and now here's some six more thousand euros, so you can buy a new electric Range Rover. Well, but which, by the way, there isn't yet. Um, that's can, not the way. Can I ask uh, just a, a segue here? I'm thinking about it from a, um, a software technology solution perspective, and I'm wondering, Xiao, if you've got something to add on that. Oh. Uh, no, absolutely. And good morning. Uh, thanks for having me. We've been working on this problem from the software perspective, a bit like say, uh, for the past 10 years now. And uh, <coughs> we met many of the difficulties that Antonio was mentioning, and also making a bridge a bit to Pedro's first presentation. Uh, sorry, Luis's first presentation. Um, it's, a, it's, much more about, it's much more about changing the, um, the way people are used to doing it than about the technology or reconversion or, or it's not that the car is more comfortable than the other solutions as you as you mentioned exactly it's sometimes i've had no other solutions as a, as a personal anecdote um i did drive here i also have the same problem you do but a, a lot less time apparently <laughs> uh, although i drive believe me so i'm kind of hedging in, in that in that situation but yeah uh, just just a couple of weeks ago i tried to take the train it made more sense for me that that, that specific day to take the train. And I got it in the evening, I got to the station, tried to buy a ticket, because I'm not a frequent user, so I don't have a monthly pass. Uh, tried to buy a ticket, there were no tickets. Literally, the machine had no tickets to sell. So we're focusing on these huge challenges where we're not even you know, figured out the small ones. Like, how do people who are not, used, who are not frequent users, how, how can we help them navigate, pay for, and integrate? the existing mobility solutions, which we know have, the, have their problems, the, f the frequency, the connections, you know, the, the coordination, all that. But let, let's, let's start by just solving the, the, the smaller parts. <laughs> we're still in that, in that point. And, and, and sometimes I have a feeling that we're, all, we, that we're trying to you know, invent a flying car, uh, a, bit, a bit here like Pedro, but we haven't really figured out how to just you know, ma make what we already have simple to use. And I've experienced this in, I, I always try to, when I travel, try to exp experience the public transportation systems abroad. And ours is not bad. Ours here in, in Lisbon is not a bad transportation system. It has its, its, its struggles. It has a lot of uncertainty around it. So it doesn't really, doesn't really like to follow schedules that much. So there's a lot of uncertainty. If you need to be at a specific time somewhere, you're always having to you know, leave home a little bit earlier, but in terms of the quality of the equipment, it's not, it, it's not a bad system. But the, I, th I think what, what, is, what is missing is how do we do then, how do we create conditions for people to use it? Especially the people who are not frequent users. You know, people who have a monthly pass, they know how to navigate. They know exactly which bus to take from point A to point B, from their home to their work, or what, what's the schedule for that, but they know this. It's people who don't know how to use it, it's daunting. And that's why most people actually then defer to the subway, because it has a very clear map. And it has very clear schedules, which doesn't necessarily follow, but the shows are there. And you know, more or less, that you can expect one every seven minutes or five minutes in rush hour, um, and like the bus. Right? But bus is the capillary transportation. So the metro can only cover points. It's the, the, for the capillarity, you need, you need the bus. And this integration of bus, metro, trains, especially suburban trains, and now the other, let's say, more softer mobility alternative, like the bike or even the, key or the shared kick scooters, it's something that is a promise, has been a promise for the past at least five years. For, for the past five years, we've been on the cusp of having this integration. Mm -hmm. You have it in uh, Rutuzinho, mm -hmm. apparently. Yep. Uh, so why don't we have it here? Why don't we have an app that allows me to pay for my, my bus ticket or my train ticket, like, like the one I tried to do the other day? Maybe, ge maybe generate some credits because I'm not using the car yeah. for that? So why is this missing? So it seems to me that there's, uh, on one hand, the, the idea of um, behavior change mm -hmm. and then technology, simple technologies or integration of technologies being an inhibitor and at the same time then also from the earlier presentations hearing that there's actually quite a lot of 
technological innovation that is going to be quite game-changing in, in the next, say, decade. Uh, do you agree that there's there's something here between these these both sides, like the um, the behaviour, but then also the technology? Do they, how do they go together? Is I guess the the crux of it. No, I'm, I'm with Peter on that one. I mean, the technology is here. It's been here for at least I mean, I've seen the, I've used it for at least five years ago. So the technology is not the problem. There are some barriers pertaining to investment. There's a, some investment needs to be done, but there's a missing will. And the feeling that I have, and this is not a scientific, uh, you know, scientific study or anything like that, but the feeling that we see, or generally when we speak to people in the in the, um, the market, is that there is no willingness from the established players to do something like this. There's no willingness. I mean, yes, we can do some pilots. Yes, we can do some. You know, some small-scale projects, etc. But there is no willingness to invest. There's no willingness to actually bring this forward because status quo makes sense for them. So, wh why, why bother? Why, why having to do this? And we've seen that financial incentives work. We've seen this with EVs. The the amount of EVs that we see on our roads these days. I mean, for a country, for, for a country of our size and of our economic capacity. It's immense. I mean, especially around the, the, the city centers, the number of EVs has just grown exponentially. And that's mo mostly because of the um, fiscal benefits. Only applying to companies, but it's, no, it's not a, anymore. Uh, not anymore. I know. I know. <laughs> but for companies, the, no, if, you can deduct, if, you, if you can deduct, if you can deduct the VAT, it's 20 percent less, and people and, and private individuals cannot do that. That's the main fiscal incentive: is deducting VAT. Um, but that works. So. So We've seen that this works. Why not, you know, put it uh, in other in other projects? Actually, uh, <clears throat> you, you started by asking everyone uh, how did he, how he came here, and uh, your conclusion was that you should have come on tra public transportation, and that's almost like common knowledge. Uh, but let me just give you an example. So I, I came on a pretty sustainable motorbike and I live in Costa de Caparica. And uh, actually we developed a, a project last year where we took 12 students from here to the COP that was in Glasgow, and we gave them some you know, instructions. The way to evaluate their path from here to, to Glasgow. What's the best way to, to do it? But the, 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 the question is, what does the best way mean? And uh, for us, and how we developed this, we gave them three different uh, types of analysis. So one is time. Time is really important. Independently if we're in a carbon neutrality pathway or not, time is critical. So you should put that into your evaluation. The second one was, of course, money. Money still is you know, cash is king, it's still king, and it's going to be, you know, still always going to be a vector on your decision. And the third one was CO2. So we, gi we gave them a, form a formula, and every decision was valued upon that formula. So they, they could understand, okay, so now I'm going to save 10 minutes here, but it's going to cost me 100 euros. Or maybe it's going to, you know, I'm going uh, uh, walking, but it's going to take three hours to get there. Maybe on that specific uh, uh, small journey, maybe I can take a taxi, because it's the only thing that it's available, that, that it's fast enough to save three hours. And that is actually how I see the world moving forward. We have better, we have to have better tools to help us decide on what is already available for us. That's why I told, the first thing that I said was technology is no longer the critical issue. It's not that we're not, we should evolve technology and we, we still have things to solve, but it's not a critical path. The critical path is how can we have the better decision to choose the best technology? And that's, I think, uh, really the, the, the critical way to move forward is we, we got to have tools that help us decide the best way possible to move, to use energy, to how to, you know, nowadays, even myself, I, I work on this area. 
But sometimes I look at a package and I don't know what to do with it. Is this like the yellow uh, thing that I have to dispose on the yellow? Is, uh, is this common garbage? We don't have enough information in order to make the best decisions. Yeah. So what is the role then of having, uh, for example, a shared vision or a roadmap or a strategic plan for the future? I understand Lisbon actually has a mobility plan for 2030. Um, I'm curious to know, do you all know about this plan and how do you see Lisbon being prepared for the future? These technology <laughs> ideas are emerging so fast. Are they part of the plan? Is Lisbon leading the way here? I think I can. Do I really have to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> I can go right. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know if, I think, I don't know if Lisbon is, is leading the way. I think there are certain things that Lisbon is, uh, is been doing, which uh, we, we only have the results on the long term. It's not, uh, we can't evaluate most of those in the short term. They, they imply lots of changes. Let's see the, the, the pathways for the bicycles that are getting built. Now, I think everybody agrees that uh, one of the main choices for people using bike is feeling safe while using it, the bike. Now, the discussion goes, where do you build that, right? How do you build it? And, but I think that's a good discussion to have. You're not discussing if uh, it makes sense or not. At the same time, I mean, if, here in Lisbon, we did lots of investment on that area, but right now, using the bike represents around two to three percent of the the daily moves from A to B. So it's still very short. So we need to engage more and to articulate more. One of the things that would were we really should look into it, and Antonio gave that example. I mean, we talk about Lisbon, but Lisbon is a set of cities. It's a metropolitan area. So going from Estoril to Amadora, <laughs> that should be pretty easier. It's not. And this happens not just here in, in this area, but on the north also, I mean, uh, Porto metropolitan area, you have Porto, Gaia, uh, Matosinhos, uh, all, all, the, all the cities, I mean all the cities, they, they, we need to look into them, not just as city but from a geographical area point of view, which it's difficult because they, they represent different municipalities with different agendas, with different needs. So we need to figure out how to, 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 bring, it, to bring it together. Um, one, 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 one last thing I wanna, I wanna, I wanna add. Um, when we talk about either technology, if it's, uh, if, if what's the role that technology needs to play around, around these issues, I think it's clear one, one thing. I'm, I'm doubtful that without technology, we are able to do what it needs to be done in the time frame that we need to do it. Let's be clear, we are seven years away from the need to slash 45% of our carbon emissions in Europe. Well, worldwide, Europe is 55% and that's on the short side because really we should look into around 60 to 65. This is the number, okay, in Europe. Which is, which, which is crazy. We only have seven years to do this. It's, it's nuts, okay? So without the technology to scale this, we are not able to do it. At the same time, I fully agree again with Luis that the tipping point is us changing the behavior. We can throw the technology that we want, we can throw the money that we want. If we don't add the behavioral change, we won't meet the goals that we need to meet. This is very clear, it doesn't matter what the plan is. So it's um, up to all of us and not the, the policies then, or is it a combination? It's all of it. Yeah, it's all of it. It's our behaviors, our mentalities, it's better decision makers, it's uh, better, better application of the technology that already exists, yeah. and um, well, I, I really agree with everything that's been said here. It's um, uh, even though we each one uh, faces this problem in our own. Uh, uh, I, I try to be, you know, um, what's English word? Transversal? No. Um, yeah. 
I, I, well, I'm not a bike guy, I'm not a public transportation guy, I'm not a tech guy, I'm not a car guy. Uh, I try to look at uh, things uh, in a global way and uh, see how we can solve it. And energy, it's behind all these too. Um, <coughs> the problem is how we are doing things. We are the lucky ones, we live by the sea yeah. uh, in Portugal and we have these big huge problems. Imagine the guy that lives uh, the 200, uh, 200 kilo case, uh, um, uh, well, inwards. Um, uh, let me say, let me tell you, in, 19, in the 1960s, we had 3,600 uh, 3, kilometers of uh, railway. We have 2,500 now. We were shutting down railways and building three highways uh, parallel to it. And then, oh, how come nobody uses the train anymore? Yeah, we know why. The, the, uh, we're talking about integration here, and if we move a, a little bit from the metrop metropolitan areas, they're not talking about integration, they have, they're talking about having anything, something. They don't have trains, they don't have buses, they don't have um, uh, shared vehicles, they don't have anything. Uh, so the only way they, they, they can come here, for instance, and it, unfortunately, they do have to come here or to Porto many, many times to solve things. Um, the only way they can come here is by car. Oh, but then we charge them a lot while they're doing anything here because their car is a huge problem and we need to charge them a lot. We've, we've said, um, I believe it was you, you said a very, a very interesting thing. The positive incentive works a lot. But we keep uh, doing it the negative way. Now, you pollute, you pay. Well, the people with money will thank that. Because how much do I have to, what's the bill for me to keep on polluting? This is not, social, this is not solidarity, this is not social, socially sustainable. It's the other way around. Um, the, the Porsche guy will thank if the parking meters are really expensive. Because the guy that works in the factory will have to well wake up three hours earlier to take four means of transportation to get to his work because he cannot bring his old car anymore to the city. The other guy will thank that because he won't have traffic anymore and all the places the places will be for him. This is not socially sustainable. It's the positive way. Mm -hmm. uh, you, we have to give incentives. Not, not like Tesla, for instance, no, we don't pollute, so we sell the right to pollute to those who pollute. This is not sustainable, socially. The money, and just to end it, sorry. Um, of course the money is also very important, but we must think that it's in, in third place. Environmental, social, because one without the other. We don't want to save the planet. The planet will stay here long before it gets rid of us. It gets fed up of putting up with us. Um, so without s social sustainability, environmental sustainability is, so is nonsense. Um, but, and then comes a financial sustainability. It's in the third place. Otherwise, we will long be gone, but money will be living here very happily after, uh, ever after. This makes no nonsense, uh, no, no, no sense. So, um, yes, money is, a, and sustainability nowadays already in many, many cases is cheaper than non-sustainable ways of doing things. That's where information is very important uh, and um, where the, 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 those little technical things like apps and things and putting everything together so we can know how to do things is very, very important. Just, just, just a short note on the incentives. Um, one of the discussions that has also been around for a long time and kind of tying this together with the, the mobility side of things is the idea that companies, instead of giving their employees cars as part of the package, which nowadays they do, they could actually pay for their mobility budget. But this has been a conversation, again, that's been going on since 2017, and it's not gone any further because there's no technical implementation, and so there's no, there's no political decision on that, and we keep going. Every, every year this gets discussed around October when we present the, the next year's budget, it gets discussed, it never happens. And that there's no actual uh, explanation of why it doesn't happen. But the, the, the point with cars is, if you need a car, you buy one. In the moment you have one, you have a sunk cost, and, every, and you're just basically weighing the cost of parking. 
and fuel. Now, nowadays, it's, it's quite high. It's 90% of the time. It's parked. But if you already have it, if you already have the car at home, then all the other choices become immediately much more expensive, be it sharing or being you know, whatever, whatever it is. So you're trying to get rid of that first investment. And that kind of ties into what Antonio was saying. If, if I need it for even just once a week or twice a week, but I really need it for those, uh, for those, um, for those moments, then all the other alternatives immediately become more expensive because I already paid for insurance, I already paid for you know, the monthly cost or whatever of the car. And especially if the company is giving me that car as part of my, of my pay package because it's not taxed or it's taxed a lot less, it's, so, it's a no-brainer. So keep, people keep getting cars, cars keep getting in cities, and we're further away from the neutrality pathway. This is, let me just add, add one thing. Um, this, this, this approach of having a, a mobility budget to be able. Um, so we, 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 we at SAIA, we work with this uh, big company here in Portugal, uh, Salvador Caetano. And we, we built with them something that is uh, it's already on the market called My Car Flix that does exactly this. It gives uh, employees on companies a budget okay, that can be uh, uh, either can come out from the salary, either is a, uh, an add-on on top of, it doesn't matter. But you have a budget for you to spend on mobility in this case from the verticals of Salvador Keita, okay? It's a closed one, it's not, it's not <laughs> open. But the thing is, I agree with you, they, the market wants to move in that direction, it's clear. But at the same time, it's more fiscal efficient to give a car <laughs> than give this kind of solution, okay? But they already exist, we already build it. Again, I know some of them sounds like future, and so, no, no, it's already there, it's on the market. If you guys go to LinkedIn, to, to Google, whatever, my car fleet's already there, your company can go on it. But at the same time, again, I, I say it again because it's true, policy needs to, to move as faster as the technology, the product, the service. It takes too long, yeah. it just takes too long. No, te technology, I think I agree with you and, and with Luis, it's no longer the problem. We have it enough technology to, to sort 80 or 90% of the problem. Yeah. It's willingness to do it, and then there's the policy side to it which creates these distortions, and we're just speaking of two very specific ones, but they, they could, the, the same policy could be tweaked to create positive distortions. And again, th we have good examples of this, things that have worked, we should apply them more broadly to other problems. So um, we've talked a lot about here on many of the challenges. I'm curious to know where you get your sources of inspiration and uh, what you, if you could pick out something you see happening in mobility that gives you inspiration and is um, kind of like um, a signal of hope. So what stands out? I have to say I'm very inspired by the tech side of it. This is just me, just thinking about these uh, these uh, aspects. But I also understand. I think there's so much uh, around um, mindsets, behaviour, identity, and I'm curious whether that's also a generational question as well. That um, people's sense of identity, how they what they associate as their own value in their lives, is very much connected to ownership versus access. This is some of the questions that I think come up, and so I'm curious, like, what do you see as uh, a sign of hope for the future? Okay, okay. Let, let me go, maybe go first. Not so much as an inspiration, but as a real story that I think can, can, be, can be a little bit inspiring. One of the projects that we're currently working on, it's in the US. You could not have a more car-centric culture than the US. And it's in, obviously it's in California, so it's you know, not not, uh, not the core US, but it's still in the US. And a public transport operator understood that they need to put cars in stations so that people can complement the network where they don't have the connection. To use Antonio's example, this would mean Metro or, or the, the train operator put some cars in stations so that Antonio can drive from Sturil to Amadora, because this is going to be the fastest way and there's no point in making a direct connection for you know, the amount of demand that there is for this, for this line. Mm -hmm. So they decided to put shared cars there for free, almost for free, they're very, very cheap, almost, almost for free, EVs. And so in the, in the most car-centric culture in the world, a public transport operator is making this investment 
because they understood that it is the integration that's going to bring more users to their existing lines. So this also has a, an economic rationale. They want more users, they want more paying users. And the way to do this is improve the network, not by doing heavy work, but by creating connections where they're most needed. I get my inspiration in, in good examples. I was going crazy because we all try to make diagnostics and uh, things are really bad, and they are. Um, and sometimes I, the, the solution is a no-brainer. Uh, why the hell we keep doing this like this? And, I, and this I mean in everything, in our behaviors, in our culture. Um, we grew up like, when I grew up, I want to have a car. It was like the first dream of the world. And then I want to be a Michael Schumacher <laughs> on the streets. <laughs> like that, and um, and, uh, and and my car needs to be bigger and uh, looks better than my neighbors, and, like, and and this goes for everything. The car is very emblematic in this, but this goes for everything. Um, and uh, but sometimes the, um, we we know that it is, we see we see the solution. It's right there. So why the hell do we keep on going the wrong way? And I was going out of my mind. And so when I started all this, um, I was uh, very activistic in, in, in political things. And I said, no, 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 let's go to the main thing. And ide ideologies and politics, they're no good if we don't survive. So, um, and so that's when I started uh, this uh, path, let's say. And uh, nowadays in Econverses, which is our like news channel and things like that, we try to focus on good examples. Um, there's all of us, we, we can diagnose what's wrong. There's lots of people doing that. There's a lot of people that they only, it seems like the only occupation that are there, this is bad, that is bad, that is bad, but there's no solution there. So we try to focus on good examples. And that's what really inspires me and makes me go on. Like things they're doing in Northern Europe, um, in, in energy, we, well, we, we, we just stayed on mobility, we didn't talk about energy. Uh, but in energy, for instance, what they're doing in Iceland is really amazing. Um, and in, in places like that. And even from companies and people that we know that they're not doing the, the, those good things for the best reasons, we keep showing those examples. You see, even these people can make good decisions and, uh, and sustainable ones. And so we try to also inspire and, um, well, the, the, the hundreds and hundreds of information I, I, I receive every day from all around the world, uh, I usually go to the titles and the headlines and say, oh, this might be a good example. And, uh, and the negative side I try to forget anymore because before I really, really get go crazy. <laughs> Nope. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's, you're pretty much right. Actually, we had a team building last Friday in our company, and of course, every company has to innovate, otherwise it will die, right? So I'm, uh, I'm talking about innovation, and I was like, what does innovation actually mean, you know? And people think, well, now I know, because I read the definition. Uh, and it's not about, so there is a difference between innovation and uh, research and development. So if you're researching and developing, it's pretty, you know, from scratch. So you're, even if you're building upon some other technology, but you're doing something from scratch. But the definition of innovation is that you're doing something that it's uh, not common on, it, it can either be a thing or a process, just not common. It's not commonly used. Mm. And uh, I was thinking about it and uh, yeah, so, you know, in order to innovate, you don't have to actually research and develop. You just have to get something that is working somewhere else and see if it fits what you're doing. Or maybe it's not being used to do exactly what you want it to do, but there are some similarities with, what, with, with your needs. So that is why when, when we're you know, developing projects, the first thing that we always do is a benchmark. So we try to see if there's anything available so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And that's you know, probably the thing that is trying, or it's more and more inspiring us to do more and, and more different things and things that actually help the people that we're working with is that you just don't have to put that much effort into uh, innovating. 
you just got to try to find something that works and fit it to the needs that they have. So I think that uh, you know anyone can be innovative uh, nowadays. We have Google. We have so many places to look for uh, for these kind of innovations. So you know we just don't have to follow the path that uh, everybody is doing. That we saw that it, it doesn't work. So let's be innovative. Um. I think one one of the things <clears throat> when I start working on on sustainability, well, I've been I've been working on technology and innovation for forever since I remember pretty much. <clears throat> but uh, when I start working on sustainability and when we start looking for the problems we 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 do have ahead, especially the time frame that we have to solve, which is probably the biggest challenge that we face as society and it really it really touched me when we start doing some projects uh, some pilots to test some of our solutions some of our products we don't we don't we test it at home of course but then we go to the street we go to different countries to different cities and we deploy and reach out to people to common users and then we talk with the people that the solution or the product is designed to serve, to measure what kind of impact can we have, and then how can, how can we scale that impact. And one of the things that for me made quite a few <laughs> difference was when you see your solution, product, service really changing people's life for the better when they come to you and say, listen, are we keeping this around? Because, you know, I haven't brought my car to work for the last two months. And this is very cool because now either I go on bicycle, one of them told me, which is far much better for me, you know? And I go and say, even when it's raining, well, you know, when it's raining, it's a little more dangerous, but even so, it's not that bad, you know? And other example was they, 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 this kind of groups start, you know, we, we do these pilots with a few thousand people and then these subgroups start talking and building on WhatsApp and, and Facebook to find different w routes and ways to, to, to do the integration with the, with, the, with the public transportation or whatever transportation because it doesn't exist in some of those places. So they figure it out and then they push for the municipality to change schedules, you know? And then two things happen. One, it's impossible to you to be indifferent to this when you see the change that you can induce. And it's it's not us doing the change. Let's let me be clear on this. Okay? We just you know, we just put something on on there and then people just grab it and move, which takes me to the second point, which is we don't need to figure it out everything. We just need to figure out where to start and then we will figure out the rest of it. And this is the main takeaway that I take from, from our products. Because usually when you design a product, you, you, you have the tendency to think about everything, all the scenarios, how it's going to happen, and, and this scenario, and this use case. And that, no, 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 no. Just let the user, the citizen, figure it out also. And they will come out with usages and ways of using a solution that we never thought about it, never crossed our mind, to be honest. Okay? And those usually are the most impactful. And it really, really changes the way our team starts looking at it. Yeah. On that note, uh, we're going to wrap up our panel now and have another presentation. I just have to see if um, we have our next, next speaker here. Uh, do I get a nod from the audience here? I'm looking for Philippe. Yes, perfect, great. Okay, so thank you for the panel. You, uh, we're going to now have uh, Philippe come up on stage. Philippe is uh, Philippe uh, Vasconcelos is the founder and managing partner at S317 Consulting, specialising in the design and implementation of energy transition, water carbon, and ESG projects. I hope that's a good introduction. Uh, so, to, to, if you come up on the stage, we'll uh, we'll say thank you to our panel, and um, we'll have some Q and A after this as well. So, thank you.